All right, so in my presentation today, I'm going to talk about transitioning from RF-based uh, analog opti optical transport for traditional HFC and as we might to migrate to uh, all digital opt optical transport between head end hubs and serving area as we transition to a distributed access architecture. <clears throat> so I'm gonna introduce a uh, layer one approach to do so that's uh, resilient, uh, low cost and, and very effective for uh, increase in the um, availability and resiliency of the network. Um, in the US, we have really two major operators that are taking a leap forward and moving their HFC networks all the way to node zero in support of uh, being ready for a full duplex. So as we migrate to this transition, right, it, it means that we're, you know, we're, we're adding many, many wavelengths into the, uh, into the access network. So, you know, basically when we migrate from a central access architecture to a distributed, distributed access architecture, we're separating the functionality of the uh, C CMTS and moving the RF modulation out of the current head end and putting it at the edge of the network in the uh, remote PHY or remote MAC and PHY uh, node. So, or else we're, you know, so we're either moving the, keeping the MAC and, and separating the PHY layer or moving the entire MAC and PHY out into the uh, field. So as we do this, we're eliminating the um, traditional RF modulated linear analog optical transmission systems in the head end and transitioning to a, a complete digital solution transport, uh, you know, all be, being 10 gigabit ethernet. Uh, today. So as we, as we do this migration, you know, we've been using optical ethernet for business services, cell tower backhaul, a uh, myriad of uh, more commercial type of, of applications. But now as we transition from uh, RF optics to uh, all digital, we really have a unified access topology and combining the HFC delivery mechanism along with commercial services. So we've got one unified topology that can support uh, multiple uh, services. So whether it's the uh, DA nodes or cell backhaul, um, even doing uh, PON overlay with remote OLT type applications, fiber to the business, and, uh, and also thinking ahead towards the rollout of uh, 5G uh, radios. So um, what we're introducing here is a, um, a really a highly integrated uh, solution and, and being a layer one solution so we can back up the link between the uh, head end and the uh, serving area. All right, so uh, let's talk about some of the planning considerations. Uh, to, in, when you're rolling out, and some of the considerations that uh, led to the decisions to do this type of approach in uh, one of the operators uh, N plus zero uh, migration path. So the one, one of the biggest thing is uh, thinking about planning for your capacity, the current and future. So if you're even starting with a little, you know, not migrating to no plus zero today, you still want to think about delivering enough wavelengths for reducing DOCSIS service group sizes and ultimately an eye towards uh, FDX deployment if that's on your horizon. And also the additional revenue generating services that might be contained within a geographical area as we you know, just talked about. Thinking about network resiliency as we're, uh, it, it becomes much, much easier with uh, having an all digital access network as compared to uh, the uh, traditional HFC optical transport. And it's becoming more and more important as you're, you know, more and more competition arises and you, you really want to be the operator of choice for these higher end services and also services that require high availability such as, you know, SLA services associated with cell tower backhaul and more services like that. So looking at this, we'll kind of compare uh, playing a layer one to a layer two option and pros and cons there. Uh, one thing to think about is trying to keep the operational simple as we're you know, exploding the number of wavelengths uh, delivered deeper and deeper into the network, uh, making it uh, operational simple for the uh, technicians that we have today. 
Uh, then I want to talk about some of the topologies. So uh, as this is just first rolling out to support many wavelengths to a small geographical area, it's really building blocks that can be uh, uh, reconfigured to uh, support uh, many configurations. Um, and we'll talk about distances that can be achieved and the uh, trade-offs and things to think about in designing those systems. Um, and we support like type of redundant rings, uh, star networks, uh, it could be just like a tree and branch type network, and uh, possibly just distributing wavelengths along a fiber route rather than uh, dropping them all in a one location. So think about wavelength growth and it'll give you a kind of idea of what's going on with the, the transition to N plus zero is uh, today we have a, a node and we're delivering a, a fiber backed up solution to about a 250 to 500 home pocket where the existing uh, node resides today. And these are typically like uh, segmentable nodes. So they've been, service groups have been uh, segmented. Um, with multiple uh, wavelengths in the analog domain. Um, and then as we're moving towards, say, uh, N plus zero and eliminating all the RF distrib amplifier distribution beyond the node, uh, this quickly be turns into uh, about 10 to uh, 20 nodes, kind of like about an average of about 16 nodes, you know, and depending on the density of the particular serving area. Uh, so you can see now all of a sudden we are, uh, you know, where we maybe had four wavelengths to a segmentable node, now we have to deliver like up to 40 wavelengths to support 20 bi-directional uh, 10 gigabit optical interfaces. And then also, of course, thinking about the additional services that uh, you could take advantage by uh, building this topology and providing very high reliable uh, access to uh, business customers. And looking at resiliency options, so some of the choices and the factors that went into uh, the decisions to deploy a layer one uh, topology was, uh, of course, uh, the, you know, the pros and cons between them. Layer two, of course, if we backed up the complete, all the aggregation switches, we got complete resiliency all the way from the you know, electronics and the transceivers redundant blades on aggregation switches, all the way to the uh, RPD node. Um, so, you know, so that gives you the ultimate resiliency. But, uh, you know, what the choice was really was coming down to the cost to do so and the power consumption, space required to do so, and, and, and the cost. Um, and the primary uh, failure mechanism that we want to protect against was the a fiber cut because that's absolutely the, the longest uh, mean time to repair. If we have a fiber cup, sometimes it could take hours to recover, whereas the aggregation switches uh, deployed at the, at the CCAP location are typically um, larger centralized facilities that are manned and it's, and it's fairly quick to repair uh, a, a failure at, at that level. So, uh, so the decision was made to let's back up the uh, physical layer of the network uh, so uh, what we pulled together was a highly integrated solution to marry against the aggregation switches where we could take any optical DWDM uh, signal and transport that over the resilient ring. And uh, what we wanted to do was make this simple as well. So we in integrated optical amplification to extend that reach and overcome the multiplexing losses and the passive losses uh, associated with making the uh, network redundant. And uh, when you do some of the comparison of uh, looking at double up switch blades and uh, transceivers um, with a layer two solution, uh, look at and find about the average comes out to be about 10 watts per port uh, versus uh, doing this solution here, staying at layer one with optical amplification. Uh, where we, we, we save about a 21, 20 to 1 uh, power reduction, so in comparison. So it's quite significant. And remember, that one of the points of moving to a DA architecture was reducing the power consumption and heat management in facilities. And the other aspect was operational simplicity. In a massive deployment like this, where we're, we're dropping 40 wavelengths to relatively small geographical areas, really looked for it almost like a cookie cutter plug and play solution. Okay? 
So what we did, again, integrating all the optical components together helped reduce insertion losses, maximizing the distances, and reducing connectivity and points of failure rather than connecting multiple devices together. Um, so it's like one device to manage versus multiple devices. Uh, in terms of simplicity, we added auto level adjustments. So uh, a technician deploying this can just simply plug in the primary route distance, the redundant route distance, and in the case of a failover, we'll automatically adjust the levels to maintain uh, the proper optical signal to noise ratio in that link, and also ensure that we're not overpowering transceivers or underpowering, and again, affecting the uh, impact and receiver sensitivity specifications and signal to noise ratio. In terms of uh, the reach, so in an all passive solution, like we saw in those uh, previous diagrams, we're reaching out to 60 kilometers. And, um, and so we could do large metropolitan areas where there's ring between the node locations. Okay? But, uh, and, and, and this is the, just building blocks. And so the product is, a, you know, the solution is, is uh, absolutely adaptable to uh, extending reach. Uh, so when we, we look at it, if we move from just an all passive solution and kind of reverse the digital line extender at the, at the uh, aggregation switch and flip the direction around where we're dropping off RPD no to RPD nodes or just for you know, other optical DWDM circuits for businesses and whatnot, um, we can achieve uh, distances up to 100 kilometers uh, using the same sort of solution without any mid-span EDFAs. So, and I, and I can't think about that coming out of the, uh, you know, been doing optical DWDM in the HOC with uh, RF modulated linear optics for years and years. To do something like this and, and replace hubs, and we do this a lot, right? We're, we're especially long distance hub sites, eliminating the buildings. And if you drop 40 wavelengths over that type of distance, you're looking at uh, probably four to six fibers at least to do so. And also, it, it, with, uh, it, we would end up having at least two more mid-span EDFAs in this type of topology. So you think about the beauty of moving to the all digital uh, solution and, and the, the, how much the cost reduction and the simplicity of the network in doing so. I mean, that would save in this type of scenario like on the order of about uh, 20 EDFAs. So it's, it's quite significant. So it, it's pretty intriguing the type of distance we can move as we're migrating to um, a distributed access architecture, the savings that can be evolved and the distances that could be reached. And even taking that a step further and moving all the way out to uh, you know, kind of the limit of the range of DOCSIS, you can achieve that with a single mid-span EDFA and move all the way out to about 160 kilometers, maintain excellent optical signal to noise ratio um, in these links. Um, and one, one point of the thing when I look at these networks is uh, what I find out is uh, kind of a little bit of a word of question is when you're looking at the uh, transceivers and looking at the specifications, make sure that you're drilling down into um, the dispersion penalty compensations in these links, okay, and also the optical signal to noise ratio and designing these links properly. Many times you'll just see a specification on a transceiver that gives you minimum uh, you know, launch power, the uh, minimum receive sensitivity, and that hits a BER of 10 to minus 12. But if I, you know, when you drill down into that, that's really a back-to-back -back spec no fiber. So, you know, when we're deploying these in reality, you really have to work with your suppliers and understand the, uh, the uh, penalties due to dispersion. And you kind of see, like, uh, that between you know, going out from, uh, you know, basically you're seeing like 80 kilometer optics dominating the marketplace just to have the lower sensitivity overcoming uh, the passive losses in the networks, the multiplexing losses. And uh, so when you see like, you know, trailing off out to distances up to 80 kilometers that there's, you know, there's, there's right around about a 2 dB penalty there. So you have to take that in consideration. And then thinking about, you know, adapting to different topologies. So, you know, in the uh, node plus zero scenario that's, that's uh, happening, uh, you know, again, we're dropping, you know, up to 20 connections, so 40 wavelengths in just a small geographical area. But you could also see if you're just, you know, taking 
uh, steps in, into uh, uh, distributed access architecture where you could drop wavelengths, uh, you know, a group of wavelengths. Uh, you know, for example, if we started with 40 wavelengths bidirectional, we could be on a ring, say, and filter off X number at, at different locations along that route and set up a, a highly resilient route again. And uh, I guess one other point about extending these distances and one of the advantages of the kind of layer one solution is that we're not adding latency into the network with by con concatenating um, layer two switches or, or and uh, you know, which is very important as we start thinking about how to support 5G across these uh, networks. Uh, sometimes in the distribution network from a hub out into the uh, area, if uh, you know, say you're starting off with uh, DAA with uh, uh, larger home number pass, you know, N plus three, N plus five, or, or further, um, we can distribute to wavelengths along the way as well. So it, it doesn't have to be just, uh, you know, one size fit, fits all. There's uh, uh, many different ways to do this. So in summary, kind of the differences, pros, cons with the uh, layer one solution. Uh, again, it's content agnostic. So we're just taking uh, DWDM wavelengths in of uh, any format and transporting that across, resiliently across the network, uh, saving significant cost, power, and space by doing it at layer one and taking care of the, uh, you know, the worst case failure mechanism that, that takes too, a long time to recover from being fiber cut. Um, and then again, simp simplifying operations for technicians uh, with by having auto level adjustments and simplicity in setting up the, the uh, network. Okay, so that's what I had, and uh, we're going to open up for questions after, after we're done. Thank you very much.